We do a lot of research as to what investors are looking for in search engines like Google, and there's two themes that stand out. So first, they want to know the best stock for any given theme. And then second, once they choose the quote unquote best stock, they want to know why it's falling. So, well, it's falling because you didn't choose the best stock. Well, that's not true. So best will mean something different uh, for everyone. And of course, tech stocks are very volatile. So short term price action is no indication of the best stock or of the extent to which a company is uh, demonstrating quality. So. Today, we're going to talk about seven proteomics stocks, and we're going to show you what we look for when we're looking for the best stock. And if you're familiar at all with the potential of proteomics, then you may own one of these stocks. You're thinking about owning one of them, and the potential for the thesis is uh, growing in the face of news from AlphaFold, that's uh, artificial general intelligence, more or less, that's now able to predict the structure of proteins based on the sequence of amino acids. So on the left here, you can see how AlphaFold's algorithm previously, those little white circles, that's the extent to which it was predicting proteins for each of these sets. And then today it's pretty much able to predict all proteins that exist in nature. Now, one of our readers was kind enough to point out that DeepMind is only for natural amino acids, and it doesn't include non-conical amino acids. So in other words, it's not built to start predicting possible proteins that don't exist in nature. So if you look at this grid on the right, it's really fascinating. All those beige squares represent all possible proteins that could be created. The gray square represents known proteins. So there's a lot of potential for mankind to do some very cool things by creating new proteins. So when we look at this thesis or any given thesis for that matter, what we consider best is the market leader. So we wanna to try to identify the market leader and then hold that stock until our thesis changes or until revenue growth stalls. Now, we look for a leader based on really three simple criteria the size, which is demonstrated by market cap, revenue, which is simple enough to look for, and then revenue growth. And that last one's quite important because of this chart you see here on the right. So this is quite an interesting case study, and it involves two firms in 3D printing, Protolabs and Exometry. And here you can see how Protolabs was dominant in the year 2019, and then Exometry started growing a whole lot faster. And we had invested in Protolabs based on our find the leader approach. And when we saw that Exometry was then catching up, we actually went along both these firms. And it ended up being that our assumption that a closed loop production platform was more valuable than the software approach that Exometry was taking wasn't correct. So whilst both firms are sort of merging their business models, this was a good use case to show that you need to pay attention to growth because it sneaks up on you very quick. So look at that chart. How quick will it be before Exometry is the leader by revenues? So the other thing that you need to pay attention to is adoption. So that's usually demonstrated by how many customers a firm has, the extent to which they're platform is being used in research. And if it is a platform, consumables. So a good example of uh, drop in consumables would be Berkeley Lights, which made the short sellers question whether their platform was being used. You can see for Quanterix, a firm we're going to talk about today, their drop in consumables, which was concerning. So when we vet the companies that we're going to look at today, we're going to try to find a leader based on those criteria that we just described. So here's a look at seven proteomics stocks that we wrote about a year ago. And for each of these, you can see on the right-hand side, these are various articles we've written regarding proteomics. And the top article there in April of last year uh, listed out these seven firms. We evaluated each, and then we did deep dives on some of them like Sear and Olink and Somalogic. And you can see on the chart on the left here, how the market caps have adjusted 
based on the bear market and that expectations are now more realistic as to the potential of these firms. So what we're gonna do today is kind of go through each one and see where they're at. And we're gonna start with Codexis. So when we are vetting stocks, one of the things that we do is try to avoid concentration risk, and that could be customer concentration risk. And here we provide an example of how in 2021, 44% of revenues for Codexis came from two customers. That's fairly risky. So maybe you might say, if there's a customer that represents 30% of revenues, okay, maybe you can get by with that, but anything over 50% is a hard no. So we also look at geographic concentration risk, so for Codexis, I think the majority of the revenues come from APAC. When they list regional like that, it's difficult to say if it's any particular country or multiple countries, but there's also concentration on other things than what the company uh, has been doing. And usually that uh, involves something like the pandemic pivot, which we've seen lots of companies go down that path. And Codexis is doing some work for Pfizer and they recently lowered guidance from 152 million to 158 to 135, 141. And if we take that higher end of that guidance, then Pfizer for this year, for 2021, is going to represent a majority of their revenues. That's not good. You can see uh, the chart on the lower left here where we've shown the growth of their revenues over time. You see for 2021, we've put a red line there. That's what their growth would look like without Pfizer. So it's sort of plateaued over the last three years. And it remains to be seen how they look at the end of this year. But the fact that Pfizer represents such a significant percentage of their revenues is very concerning. So the next company we're going to look at, Quantum Psi. Here's another risk factor that we look for management turnover. And if you look at our recent piece on Editas, you can see a prime example of a company that's just an absolute mess when it comes to senior management turnover. I'll put a link to that article in the description of this video, along with the research piece that was used to produce this video. And you can see for yourself, but quantum side here, uh, they also have a, a bit of a problem. So in October of 2020, they brought on a CEO, John Stark, and they actually have his offer letter filed with the SEC. It's really interesting to look at. And then in February of this year, that gentleman resigned to pursue other opportunities. Now, whenever a CEO says that, and then somebody else steps in as an interim CEO, that's a bad sign. It means that there was no planning around that. And there was an unexpected nature to it that could be, uh, in this case, the gentleman who stepped in to replace Mr. Stark was the chairman of the board and someone who had actually founded the company and was really the CEO's boss. So whenever somebody leaves and their boss steps in to temporary, temporarily replace them, it's usually a sign that their boss showed them the door. But we don't know. What we do know, according to their latest filing, is that Mr. Stark left $4.7 million in stock options on the table. Whenever that happens, it usually means that the person who left lacked any faith in the company being able to get to where those options would be in the money. And you can read the offer letter and see strike prices and all that, they're fairly high. Well, then in June, the chief business officer resigned and also left money on the table. That individual was head of product since 2014. So that's not a good sign. What will happen sometimes when you have um, a new CEO come in is they'll bring in uh, trusted individuals to uh, fill certain positions if they think there's a real opportunity, you know, known goods in this case, it appears to be independent, not related to Mr. Stark's resignation. And then another thing that's quite interesting is they have a new COO from Millipor Sigma who came in in May and will succeed the CEO of eight years who remains as EVP of product development and operations. Not a good sign. So in businesses, when you have somebody who is in a particular position, 
let's say, move laterally so somebody else can replace them or are partially demoted or there's an appearance of a lateral move or demotion, that creates problems because that individual isn't motivated anymore. If they were the CEO, COO of eight years and then somebody else steps in, how do you think they feel about that? So this whole change that you can see in management around this company, which has promised investors $17 million in revenues this year, and we're holding them to that, there's a concern there, and QuantumSci has no revenues yet. Could this turnover be around the fact that the optimistic estimates you see here provided in their SPAC deck may have been too optimistic? It could be the case, but we don't invest pre-revenue, so the fact that there's a lot of management turnover, they don't have revenues, that's a concern. Another firm that doesn't have revenues is Nautilus Biotechnology. Taken from their SPAC deck below is the table of what we were supposed to expect. 2022, 4 million, 2023, 17, 2024, 77. And here's the latest statement. It says, guidance that anticipates the launch of the Nautilus platform by mid-2024 with meaningful early access engagements and associated revenue to begin at the start of 2024. Wow. So they're essentially saying that what we're going to expect $77 million to suddenly materialize in 2024. A lot of these SPACs just put whatever they wanted on their SPAC decks to get investors to sign up. And then when it came to actually executing, they want to sweep under the carpet all the promises they made. Absolutely not. Investors need to hold them accountable for what they said they're going to do. We're expecting Nautilus to show investors $4 million in revenue in 2022. We'll check back. Well, we probably won't, to be honest, because it's highly unlikely that they will. But we'll check back with this thesis in 2023. And we'll expect to see $4 million in revenues because that's what they said they're going to do. Now, the big news this past year was surrounding Quanterix and all the problems that came out on the table in their recent uh, earnings call. It was an absolute mess. So they're expecting a flat year this year in terms of revenue growth. You can see the chart on the left shows that hey had some pretty nice growth going there. but they're now having these internal quality issues and the chart on the right we put together shows quarterly revenues you can see the little red stick there that represents this last quarter and they had consumables drop around 30 percent going back to the earlier comment when customers aren't using your platform or they reduce usage that's a big problem maybe some of those internal quality issues became external the chairman of the board resigned essentially this firm had more issues than you can shake a stick at in that call. It was difficult actually to aggregate them all and, and send an alert to our subscribers when that happened. Now, some concerns that we have moving forward with Quanterix. Who wants to purchase life sciences instruments with stated quality issues? So customers pay attention to what companies say and do. So the dramatic drop in consumables implies that there was customer impact. So they had made mention in the call that sale of new instruments could be, uh, we'll say, they made mention about shipping 10 machines to a startup and the fact that they shipped the machines and that they were waiting to record those revenues until they received the money. Well, that doesn't sound good. That kind of uh, sounds similar to what um, that 3D bioprinting firm, Bico Group, was doing, selling product to people that couldn't pay for it. But um, the sale of new instruments we speculated could be minimal through 2023 because who's going to buy an instrument after the firm said they have quality issues and they're going back to the drawing board well you wait for them to to re-engineer the product so it doesn't have problems you can see they said we have set in motion an assay redevelopment program with the objective of improving our ability to manufacture and deliver high quality assays at scale well let's wait until they do that before we buy their product so new customers people that don't hold this equipment already will probably want to wait until that happens. We're also large layoffs. I think they can, 25% of their staff, a lot of fat was trimmed. And it was this mention of how much rework was going into the production of their products, which implied poor processes, which means incompetency. Now, the end result was that this firm has $10 per share in cash and no debt. And that when we 
analyze this when all that bad news came out investors were discounting that cash at seven dollars and 46 cents per share in other words when the stock price trades less than ten dollars per share it's actually trading at less than what those shares are worth based on the cash that they represent so we believe that was an overreaction because certainly this firm has to be more worth more than just the cash they have on hand when there's no debt now i think shares may be trading around somewhere around that ten dollar range maybe under that but it's certainly a concern so moving on to the next firm olink and this looked quite promising because uh, they're a foreign firm and you get some um that there's there's usually a discount associated with foreign firms for whatever reason probably surrounding domestic bias but um, olink the last time that we dug into this firm we looked at kits versus services so this is pretty important when we look at platforms, we don't want to invest in services, let's say physical services. Software as a service, great. That's easy to bring on new customers. You don't have any incremental costs, very few associated with bringing on new customers. But when you're doing physical services, it's difficult to scale. And you also have lower margins and a lot of price pressure. So what you see here with Olink is that this, um, table on the top here was taken from their second quarter financial results it shows how services constituted 65 percent of the revenue kit was 26 percent, and we're paying attention to kit revenues these are very high margin around 86 percent uh year over year whilst we see services actually around 60 percent, and i believe declining over time so the kit revenues are what we're paying attention to and we had last concluded that we'd be interested in taking another look once kits reach 50 percent of revenues in 2021 they were around 35 percent of revenues and the other interesting thing to note here this goes for both kit revenues and services revenues is look at q4 in the chart we put together here see how there's that big bump well when you look in their financial filings they talk about how firms like bio uh, biopharma firms government especially when it comes towards the end of the year and they have budgets with extra money in them they want to spend that money because if they don't then next year their budgets might be reduced that's not the sort of expenditures that we want a part of we want consistent revenue growth over time we don't want customers who spend money because they they have nowhere else to spend it on otherwise they're going to lose it that's not good so that was one thing we noted about olink now when we look at the valuation of all these companies we have put them here at least the ones with revenues right we can use our simple valuation ratio shows market cap divided by annualized revenues you can see here how sear is quite high so if you take a look at our tech stock catalog there's about 436 stocks in there and for about a third of those i think we've calculated our simple valuation ratio we take market cap divide that by annualized revenues and we get this ratio so if you take that universe that we have and you look at all the solid companies in there snowflake i think is around let's say the 30s lower 30s it always has been it's always been high that's probably one of the most highly valued SaaS firms out there and sear is valued over that they're a 634 million dollar company with a trickle of revenues why we're not sure but we don't we wouldn't touch a firm with a valuation ratio over 40 in the heydays of tech these days we probably wouldn't touch anything with the ratio over 20. so sear is significantly overvalued just based on that and alongside its peers now why is that well we don't know because looking under the hood there's not a lot of impressive stuff going on here so on the right hand side you can see her losses compared to their revenues which are growing at a snail's pace and are still relatively small so in the first half of this year 31 percent of the revenues came from a single customer prognom iq when you look at the details this was actually an entity formed by sear and is counted as related party revenues we don't like that we've seen that with ginkgo bioworks We've seen that with a fair number of firms where they create a subsidiary they fund it and then the subsidiary hands them back the money for access to their platform no we don't like that so that's a problem with sear 
since their IPO in early 2021. So they didn't go the SPAC route, which is great. They had an IPO, but shares haven't performed much better. They lost 84% of their value. That short-term price movements aren't, you know, should be always taken with a grain of salt, but they still can potentially lose a lot more if their valuation was in line with their peers instead of exceeding that of high quality SaaS firms. So we had come across Sear and really liked the idea of their platform when we first became introduced to Proteomics. Today, in looking at this firm, that was several years ago, they haven't done what they implied they were going to do and revenue growth is too slow. We're removing this stock from our tech stock report where we had it as a like, and we're leaving it in our tech stock catalog as an avoid. The growth is just too slow. We don't like the related party revenues. It's too small. They're overvalued, et cetera. They have a decent war chest of money, quite a bit actually. I think it was somewhere upwards of $400 million, but they, they can sit there and spin wheels without sufficient revenue growth and their competitors will be capturing market share while they do that. So firms that can't grow revenues, that's a big problem. Now we have the last firm we're gonna look at today, quite a popular one, Soma Logic. Now, similar to Olink, the last time we looked and even today, the majority of Soma Logic's revenues also come from offering services, not good. That's expected to change as they prepare to relaunch their kits on an upgraded platform. Their Q2 2022 uh, results were very weak. You can see that here in the chart on the right, see that drop. These were accompanied by revised 2022 revenue guidance of 80 million to 90 million. And we've plugged in the lower end of that range in the green bars that you see there. That's if that, uh, that amount needed to get to that number was spread out evenly over the next two quarters. You can see how growth started going pretty good there but it's sort of flatlined. Why? Well, of course, the supply chain issues have been wreaking havoc, as all firms tell us. And they made a mention that, you know, this particularly affects firms that provide services as opposed to a distributed platform. That's why we want to invest in distributed platforms. They also talked about a slowing in spend from active customers. And they made this comment, and this was taken from a transcript, I believe from Seeking Alpha, of their of the call so that's uh hoping the ai algorithms that were doing the nlp got it correctly but they said customers don't call you and tell you that they'd like to spend more money you have to go out and get that really well if this is such a great platform if it's a leading platform and they talk about how they have this great advantage there's all this opportunity why are you having to go out and convince people to use your platform and he's talking about existing customers when he says tell you they like to spend more money that's a concern customers should use your platform and be like wow this is great saw that with planet labs right so they were talking about how they had this metric which was all the customers who stopped spending money that they could bring back that, that's not the sort of value proposition we want to see that these platforms should sell themselves now soma logic talks about how they're a big data set. They have more big data than anybody else. So they've been doing these services and collecting all this data and it provides them with this great data set that gives them a competitive advantage, but customers are hardly knocking down the door to access it. So there's some real questions around um, how valuable a platform is if customers just stop using it or have to be convinced to use it. So our conclusion with SomaLogic is the same as we reached earlier this year when we looked at them. Uh, we'll check back in uh, during 2023 unless something significant happens before then. And the articles that we've written about firms like Somalogic, uh, Sear, et cetera, I'll put links to those also in the description of this video. Now, when we check in with a set of stocks like we've done today, um, we like to check in with firms about once a year. So when we post a video on a company, people say, well, they have new quarterly results. Are you going to post a new video? No. Quarterly revenues equate to lots of noise. We've found that the optimal time to check in with a stock, whether we're holding it or we're looking at it or thinking about holding it, is annually. And the exceptions, of course, are M&A events or if there's a dramatic share price movement downwards. We don't care when share prices you know, jump for whatever reason. We care when they fall because that provides an opportunity to potentially invest or usually it's uh, because we have a lot of subscribers that pay attention to 
downward movements. As we mentioned earlier, that's what people want to know. They want to know why stock prices are falling, why the best stock that they could pick is falling. So always leave yourself a next step for names you're watching. We found this very handy to do. And you'll find in the research piece that we wrote accompanying this video where we've done that. And we've also do that in the past. And that way, when you check in, you know, after a year, you forget what you said or you forget what you were looking at. This will bring you right up to speed. So next steps for each of these firms. Very simple. Sear, looking for strong, meaningful revenue growth over multiple quarters. Right now, they don't have that. Quanterix, we expect management to surpass that low bar they set with investors. So if they're a competent management team that got all the bad news out on the table, and it certainly seemed like they did that, then we'd expect them to be able to perform better than that, which is what a, a competent management team would do. Then you've got Soma Logic. We're expecting to see them see them hit the top end of their guidance, resume growth. We want to see Olink move to have kits become more than half of their revenues. Quantum Psi needs to hit 17 million in 2022, like they promised. Codexus will take another look after they get through their pandemic pivot. Nautilus. Revenues at the start of 2024, anything before that would be surprising. So we have at least uh, some milestones that we can look to when we revisit this in 2023. So to conclude, proteomics offers loads of possibility, especially given the advancements we've seen made by AlphaFold, but a clear leader hasn't emerged yet. And it's quite interesting looking back at our pieces. We always explain why we get into a particular position. We don't have a crystal ball. So with Quanteric, several times we had mentioned, well, it's a placeholder that we'll put in place. We don't have a leader yet, but we really like proteomics. We want to have a placeholder that, that we can pay attention to. Well, that placeholder has lost a lot of its value. That was meant to be capital allocated to proteomics. And perhaps having a placeholder isn't a good idea. Maybe we should have just waited until a clear leader emerges. And that hasn't happened yet. But what we'll do is we'll check back in 2023 and see if any of these firms have um, surprised us or how they've performed related to the milestones that we've mentioned earlier. So please put your comments in the comment section. Uh, make sure to subscribe to our channel. You know, people compliment us on the quality of our research. Well, if you do me a favor, please just go and click the thumbs up on this video that will result in the YouTube algorithms sharing the video more. So like the video, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.